So let's go ahead and get this thing going then, man. Sure. So thanks for coming back onto the show again. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be learning alongside the audience on this one because I, when it comes to anything past the stuff that I have, I don't really know anything. So, um, <laughs> I, I've got plenty of questions that I know the audience has uh, as well from guys on YouTube, and I'm I'm excited to learn from you on this one. So this this episode obviously is going to be about bow tuning, and for guys that are wanting to go in from maybe you know tying a D loop into actually doing legit bow work, you know tearing down a bow, getting a bow press, doing all that stuff, and because there's definitely there's definitely levels to it, and I'm I've always been on the minor end of it. Um, mess with my mic a little bit here. I've always been on the minor end of it where if something happens out in the field, I'm going to be able to fix it, you know, most likely, but I haven't got into the tearing down and replacing strings and cables and, you know, tuning all that stuff. And so that's where you're coming in. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so let's, let's go ahead and get into this thing. So if somebody's wanting to work or start working on their bows, what would be some of the first things that you'd look at starting to do? Uh, probably, you know, I mean, if we're going the most basic guys got to have a good set of Allen's, uh, Allen wrenches, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some Torx head or, or star wrenches, but Allen's are really the, the, like, Hey, here's your most basic first tool. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. With there, with there, you can do your poundage. You can do, um, work on your site. You can work on your rest and all that stuff. Um, yeah, and a lot of bows, even to adjust poundage, you've got to take a set screw loose. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, that would be the most basic starting point. From there, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a toss-up. Uh, I really like a good uh, string level mm -hmm. and a and an arrow level. Um, yep, those right there. So here's what you got to be careful with those. Um, they're inexpensive so to speak and i have i have discovered that the levels are can be inconsistent really uh austin and i actually austin kincaid uh, i was up at his house uh, we were mapping out my new hoyt helix mm -hmm. uh, the strings on it and we were playing around with some stuff and we discovered that between the two different string levels he had they were different and uh then I came back and checked on mine and mine were different. So okay. <laughs> I, I kind of had to pick through them and figure out which ones were right. And the other ones got tossed. So one thing that I found when I'm using my um, string and arrow level is if one part's on the serving, one part's on the string, that's, that's going to give you an inconsistent reading. I, I've, I've seen guys do that. I'm not saying you did, but stuff yeah. that I figured out through my own mistakes is, is, or pushing the string going like that and just pushing one in too far. Or your string stop is pushing on the string. You've got to make sure that string stop is not pushing on the string. Because yeah. that, that, that will change your level. And those are a little difficult because they fit on there okay for tightness, but they kind of want to rock do. top and bottom. Um, that's why, like, as a guy gets more serious, you start looking at buying the machined out aluminum uh, levels that, like, the ones I have, they've got a little button on them that you can tighten them down to the string mm -hmm. so they don't come loose. Um, and then I even bought, so for the arrow levels, I bought the aluminum machined out aluminum arrow levels that are much more precise. Uh, Not these ones. Yeah. I mean, that's a great place. That is a great place to start. Uh, it, for the, for the guy who's going to just be doing basic home stuff, mm -hmm. that's perfect. You don't need to go spend, you know, the 170 bucks I just spent on two of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, I let Anthony borrow mine one time these, and I think there's like 15 bucks about, and, uh, I let Anthony borrow them. And, and then, uh, he gave me, uh, he brought them back and they were in a brand new package. I'm like, what'd you do? He's like, I freaking broke them. <laughs> so, I mean, they're not, they're not as strong. They're not probably as consistent or accurate, but for a guy like, you know, like me that has just, you know, it, it, at my level, it, it gets the job done. It'll get you farther down the process. And uh, one thing that I see guys doing is, and I, I don't really know why, I guess maybe from just a, a weird angle to look at it, I guess, is, is I see, you know, you'll have it on the string and then maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but if, <laughs> if, if you have it way out here on the tip of your arrow, I mean, way out here, it's kind of like hard to like 
look at them both. So I just bring them in next to each other because it's still the same angle. I mean, the arrow is still at the same angle. Is there a reason that guys go all the way out to the tip? Because to me, that just seems like a big pain not, in the ass. Not a good reason. But I, <laughs> the, the problem is, is, I mean, we all know arrows will flex too. So as you get like the aluminum one I have, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. You put it out there on the end and your arrow is going to flex a little bit and you're going to get a false reading. So I run it a couple inches away from the riser on the arrow, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, like on the Eastern Axis arrows, it's on the logo somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know. Yeah. I usually, or or just in front of it. Yeah. It seems like I'm on the uh, string side of the, uh, of the riser, the back, you know, the grip side. And um, I'm just, you know, kind of doing a quick, quick thing because I don't, I don't even have a freaking bow vise to where I can just have a stationary bow and then move it and do that. So I'm always like eyeballing it and just basically jimmy rigging it. And so having them both like right here, it's easy to get them both um, there. Yeah. The audience there. So um, that's, that's the reason I do that. I mean, I've always wondered, like, man, I see guys and then they're, they're going back and forth. It's like, just move the freaking thing farther towards the knock, man. <laughs> I just, I, because the fletch is getting away and stuff, I run ours, like I said, just in front of the riser, mm. uh, you know, and, and it seems to work well. So, um, you know, those would be probably the next tools I would buy. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, a good pair of D loop pliers, potentially, um, you can get away with doing D loops without those, um, by using like a pair of needle nose. Yeah. And just, you know, and just prying in reverse, but you gotta be really careful that you don't pry too hard um, on them. And there's tons of different, um, D loop pliers out there, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's a relatively inexpensive tool, you know, between the levels, 15 bucks, like you talked about is probably average for, for a set of those, you know, 20 bucks for a set of D loop pliers ish. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I paid, well, these are freaking from Cabela's. I think I paid 35 and you're probably paying for the name because of the Easton ones. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you could find cheaper ones out there. Yeah. Uh, in that $20 range that you're talking about. And still even 35 bucks isn't that bad for a guy that just wants, you know, just wants to do right. his, his basic work on his bow and maybe a buddy's bow or, you know, his kids or his wife stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then from there you start getting into the higher end stuff and, and okay, now we need to start talking about bow presses and yeah. <laughs> bow vices and, you know, uh, but those are really your most basic tools. Um, you know, get yourself a, a, a spool of 3D serving from Cabela's or Lancaster or somewhere, you know. This is, um, when I showed Austin Kincaid this, he, uh, he's like, dude, throw that shit away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is, this is, I think, from Cabela's, and uh, it's really cheap serving. It's it, you know, it's not near as nice as the stuff that, you know, Austin uses on his strings or anything like that. But, um, I've served a lot. I've served ton tons with this thing. I mean, the spool is actually quite, I don't know, I'm not going to say halfway done, but there's been quite a bit of uh, spooling done with that thing. And, you know, I learned how to serve and, and do all sorts of thing with this one spool. I mean, it's, I want to say it was like 30 bucks. I, I'm not sure. It's not, not nothing too expensive. Yeah. So, and you don't even have to have the jig with it like you have mm -hmm. you know those jigs are meant for laying down serving like you're mm -hmm. redoing center serving or end servings um you know if you're just going to be tying on uh you know some knock sets yeah. or tying in your peep you just need the the spool of serving itself and you don't have to use 3d it's what we use more than anything um what do you mean by, by 3d is that just the material or yeah it's so yeah it's literally just uh bcy's 3d material Okay. Do you know what this would be? Because it just it doesn't even feel near as nice as what you guys are using. It's uh, I, Poly Grip twenty five point zero two five or point zero two zero point zero two zero. There we go. Yeah. Cheap. Um, stuff. Yeah. I, Austin's the serving guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just I, I buy three D and call it good, and then when I when I have to or when I have a spool around or when I want to buy a new spool for laying down center servings, I just call Austin and be like, "Hey, <laughs> what do I need?" He's like, "Here, I'll send you a spool." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so, so talking about serving, that kind of leads into um, D loop, and this is um, Pine Ridge Archery super cheap serving as well. <laughs> 
And uh, this is the stuff that you probably see a lot of shops using this stuff. I'm guessing um, just regular, regular, um, you know, like a, like a sportsman's warehouse guy would probably tie something with, with this or have a huge spool of it. There's 15 feet worth of D loop material here. And I've had this for a couple of years. It's lasted me forever. And I've tied quite a bit of D loops with it. Actually, no, I, this is my second one. Um, and I've tied quite a few freaking D loops with this thing. I like the Pine Ridge stuff personally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, each shop's going to kind of like what they like. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we use a lot um, is the Pine Ridge stuff. Mm -hmm. And it works really well. Uh, you know, uh, one thing we kind of ov overlooked as far as basic tools, a good razor blade, razor knife, mm -hmm. and a lighter. Yep, I got my lighter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, those are, again, sometimes it's easy to overlook the most basic things, but um, it, it is. And, and so you just take a regular like razor blade, um, that you'd buy in a pack or in those little boxes. Yep. Yeah. I buy, I buy the Stanley ones that you can mount like to the wall or whatever and just slide oh. them out. But e either way, you know, just, a a, a razor blade of some sort, you just got to be really, really, really careful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've right. seen way too many people cut their strings, trying to cut the serving off, uh, for their peep or knock sets or taking D loops off, mm -hmm. you know, so you just got to be really careful with that. But yeah, what I've done is, is I've kind of sh shied away from the sharp edges. I, I use like a really small pair of like scissors and then I'll, I'll cut that away and then I'll, I'll get the rest of the D loop off with maybe my pliers and I'll just kind of work them off. I, I get really sketched out about nicking my string and I've seen Anthony burn, um, <laughs> probably I'll, I don't know how many strands off of his string, but he, I've seen him literally have to have uh, Austin send him a new string after he was done working on his bow at my house. And I was there, I watched him do it. I'm like, I sh we're both, re we're both responsible for that one. Cause I watched you do it. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Cody, so, Cody did one, uh, what, like a week before season last year on his string. Wanted to move his peep up. Oh God. <laughs> so, yeah. My son Cody out there has the razor blade and ended up cutting his string oh. a little bit. It was still suitable, you know, we served over it. And yeah, I was going to say you could yeah. screw over and probably just keep keep going. Yeah, and Austin built him a new one pretty quick. Yeah. So another thing that I um, that I personally, and it's just little tiny variations of products. I, I like these little L uh, or uh, Allen wrenches with the arms, and this is to work on a spot hog mainly, or some of the um, arrow rests that you get out there, pain in the ass to get to some of these um, set screws or screws, for, basically. For the Hoyts? Mm -hmm. that's almost in the you have to have it uh especially like when you're running a qad on the hoyt uh you know with their year. bridge with their bridged riser the way it is the the tech riser or whatever mm -hmm. uh, you can't get a normal allen in there you can't even get a normal l allen in there you need one of those shorties and that's why the qad comes with their own allen that's super short like that right um, so, so that's that's a good point. So for, um, you know, so most of these guys that have these pain in the ass screws, they're going to have the correct one to work on. Like spot hog usually throw, I have, I don't know how many of these I have. I have quite a few of them. Spot hog usually throws one of these in the package. I mean, they, they do throw these in the package because if you don't have them, good luck on working on it. Yeah. Um, but, um, so I, I know this isn't a uh, bow tuning. This is more of an arrow tuning thing, but I brought, I brought down some other stuff because if we're, if we're, you know, doing all this other stuff. This is an arrow spinner. It's a cheap arrow spinner by a good brand, Apple. I like Apple archery. Um, and then this is a G5 arrow, squ arrow squaring device. It's the G5 ASD tool. Um, what arrow spinner are you using and what, what are you using for these? So on your arrow spinner, I was going to ask you, how well do your arrows kind of free spin? So there's, there's ones um, like Corey Miller uses the one that has the bigger wheels. Yeah, so it's, say, it's the Pine Ridge, and that's what I use. Yeah. I was just wondering how yours worked. I haven't played with that so one. Yours is probably 10 times better than this one. Um, it, the, you cheap. just spin those, and then they'll go just forever. This one might spin for a second, second and a half. And okay. So I, I wouldn't suggest getting this one. This was a gift from my mom for like years ago um, for Christmas or something, but um, hindsight, you know, if I was going to get another one, it would be the, the one that you have the pine, you said a pine Ridge one. It is pine Ridge and they're plastic, but they work fairly yeah. well. Um, this one's nice. I mean, it's, it's nice, but it doesn't spin as well. I mean, it's got, it's, it's, it's not plastic, but 
It's so lasted got, a long time. I got a hold of Tim Gillingham, actually. I was watching one of his videos, uh -huh. and he had a really nice aero spinner. And again, I'm always trying to find the most precise, precise and best equipment I can. Mm -hmm. and so I messaged him, and I'm like, hey, where'd you get your aero spinner? And he's like, oh, it's, a, it's one I had made. I'm like, well, you want to make some more? And he goes, oh, funny thing is I have some prototypes, you know, that I want to make. But anyhow, yeah, I, that Pine Ridge is about the best one that I know of. Yeah. Um, so Fire Knock, the Fire Knock people. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorge, I think is how you say his name. <laughs> uh, Mad Scientist. Mm. Uh, he has one as well that goes with like on his uh, aero prep system. Mm-hmm but I don't think they free spool. And for me, that's kind of a big deal. I don't want to have it roll slow. I want to spin it. I want to watch it spin at a relatively high rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so yeah, the Pine Ridge run, they're like 19 99, 20 bucks again. Oh, really? I bet this was more than that. Um, those cheap ones, the, the, the plastic ones that just mm -hmm. free spool, um, and they work well. So, uh, Anyway, uh, as far as the aero squaring stuff, I use Firenox actually, um, their aero prep system. Really? I haven't yeah. seen that one. So it's, uh, it basically has a, a flat face that you can slide in and out as much as you want. Mm -hmm. and then you, it comes with two rollers that are kind of like the rollers you have on your um, aero spinner, uh, but they're movable. So you can put them as close together as you want. And I actually bought a third one to put on there just so when we're squaring them, um, we've got really good solid surface. And they're all, mine are only about an inch and a half apart. Okay. Well, that makes one better thing. sense because when, you, when you're when you pushing down on them, you're going to introduce an angle onto the end of the arrow. And I, I, you know, when I spin mine, I'm spinning them because this thing, it doesn't spin very good. I'm spinning them right here. I go like that. I don't push because that arrow is going to jump off sometimes. I just yeah. spin it right here on the on the uh, on the rollers and stuff, and that's just stuff you know you figure out through using it, and um, it so, makes sense why you would do that on yours. Yeah, so the fire knock one, um, literally, you just go buy sandpaper that has like a sticky back to it, and you just cut out squares okay. and stick them on there. And so Home what Depot's grid? cheap place. Cheap what place grid are you using? Uh, I want to say, gosh, I want to say it's. 110 or okay something like that i can't remember <laughs> no worries no worries so let's go ahead and so we've got kind of like the minor tools i can't really think of anything else a guy would need for for just tuning maybe um not for tuning but you know a guy might want a grain scale mm, yeah i you didn't know, bring basic, mine down here basic shop tool again you can get some stuff relatively inexpensive i went and bought a uh one for reloading mm-hmm Grain scale is actually a reloader scale. Um, I felt like it was a little more precise. It gave me a weight to zero it with and calibrate it with every once in a while. So interesting. I actually, when I was looking at getting um, a scale a while ago, um, I was asking around, you know, looking for ones. And then um, it's actually kind of funny. Um, I've got some friends because here in Oregon, pot's legal. And they're like, go to the pot store and buy a scale from the pot store. They're super accurate. I'm like, what? Like, first of all, no. <laughs> Second of all, um, how, how, you know, how expensive are they? Will you, will you go buy me one? <laughs> kind of and, um, I think they're actually cheaper than a lot of the, you know, um, archery ones that you'd get out there. And, and from what I've heard, you know, if you live in a state and, and, and you're old enough to go walk into a store and you're wanting to get a cheap one, it sounds like they're accurate and pretty cheap. So you take that, take it or leave it. I mean, I, I'm not going to go to a pot store to go, you know, buy a freaking scale or anything, but, um, I, I just kind of a funny story. My friends were like, yeah. And then, you know, they, they smoke and everything. And it's just, it's kind of a, <laughs> kind of a unique little, little life hack, I guess, if you want to go get a cheap scale. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you really can get cheap ones off of eBay that yeah. are pretty decent overall. So, um, and then beyond the, the, uh, grain scale, you might want to get a bow scale, you know, just a weight scale to actually check your draw weight. What one are you using? Because the uh, I, I've I've seen really big inconsistencies with the ones that I've used, uh, electronic ones, anyways. And maybe it's the way we're using them, but um, like the ones that you pull, like you actually draw the bow. Um, yeah, I got a friendly. funny story about one of those. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I just I so I, I actually went to Bymart and bought one of their good um, vigil scales. Mm -hmm. When I say good, I don't know, 
was 50, 60 bucks. I'm like, ah, you know, and I checked in on a few things and it's been really consistent for me. So I've been happy with that. Mm -hmm. That's my main one. Uh, I have one from last chance. I've got one. My press. I get a little worried about that looking at some of the welds and how small certain things are on it. And it's like, uh, you know, on an 80 pound bow, is this going to hold together? I've had some 90 pound bows come in the shop Mm. and so those make me nervous. But the funny thing was, so my bow, my helix Mm -hmm. has been saying 82 pounds peak weight, you know, it's an 80 pound bow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, well, so I got the last chance, uh, hand draw one Mm -hmm. looked really, really nice. Put it on there, drew it back. It said I was pulling 85.6 pounds. Hmm. So, That's but I could make it depending on how hard I pulled, I could make it change. Oh, I how see. How fast I ripped it back, how hard I pulled, how slow I pulled. Um, so it dropped down to 84 and then up to 86 and 85. <laughs> it was all over the place. Well, so I, checked, I checked my digital one against my last chance one. Mm-hmm. I checked my two. So I have one that hangs that I can just you know, kind of pull down on. Yeah. And then I checked my last chance one. Those two were both reading. One was like 81.8 and the other one was like 82.4. So I'm like, ah, good enough. I would believe those because, the, you know, it seems like the Hoyts usually run like two pounds over from, from what I've seen. It's just, you know, a couple pounds over is, is, but 80, you know, five pounds over is quite a bit. That just doesn't yeah. seem accurate. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's not an 85. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if, um, if a guy's wanting to go to the next level and there's one, we you know there's that, um, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a mind blank here. Austin uses one. I think you use one too. It's a for center shot. It's that little ruler. Um, oh, so that's, yeah, it's a great point. <clears throat> I literally just went down to like an office depot or home depot, mm-hmm. or not home depot, excuse me, like office depot staples, one of those and got one of the, uh, just, it's a, it's a real small ruler. It's like a six inch ruler mm-hmm. that does everything in 30 seconds of an inch. Okay. And so the other thing you could use though is a micrometer. So if you really wanted to get fancy with it and very technical, you can get a micrometer and, um, you know, run from the edge of the arrow, like the outside edge of the arrow to your riser, both on the front and back of the riser. If that makes sense, you know, of the shelf, I guess I should say. Right. Uh, It's a little easier than trying to do center. Um, as long as the arrow stays in place, that's really a consistent way to do it. I've done it that way before is just figuring out what the outside of the arrow needs to be off the shelf in so, order for the center shot to be right. Yeah, and just to, just to describe it a little bit different way, so what you're doing is you're getting this ruler, you're putting the arrow in the rest the way it's going to sit when it's shot, and then you're mm-hmm. measuring from, say, the back. So you say the back of the riser, so the grip side, and then you're measuring from the side of the, of the riser towards the arrow and then you're hitting the outside uh, outer edge of the arrow and then you're going to the front side of the riser um, yep. towards where the sight would be on that side of the riser we're not talking um left right we're talking front and back of the riser yes. and then you're measuring to make sure that's the same distance from the arrow there as well yeah yeah so basically you know you're, you're going you've got your shelf arrow sits over the shelf mm-hmm. and then you're measuring off the edge of the riser on the, like you said the grip side the back of the shelf mm-hmm. i call it the back of the shelf and then your sight side, you know, up front. And you just want those numbers to be consistent. If you're measuring to the, me- to the middle, 13 sixteenths for a lot of manufacturers is kind of their starting point. Hmm. Uh, some will tell you seven eighths. Um, I do, again, my ruler's in 30 seconds of an inch, and I really like to use that ruler. I like it small because sometimes it's hard to get it on the riser to be able to touch the arrow and get it on the riser and not have a curvature to the riser or something else. You've got to hit a flat spot. Mm -hmm. Of course, Hoyt's have the rubber, you know, thing that they've put on the shelf. So you've got to try and hit that metal, which is going to be the consistent part. Makes that definitely makes sense. So for, for the kind of the next step, something that I've been looking at getting, and it's like kind of like this um, thing that would mount on a desk and it's like got this arm and it's like on a uni ball and it clamps onto your bow. Um, it's orange. I don't know that's, what it's called. Oh, it's an OMP Versa Cradle. Yeah. That's what, I, we, that's what we use. It's a bow vice, but yep. they call it the Versa Cradle. Yeah, that's, that's the one that I, yeah, that's the one that I would get if I, and I, I do plan on getting it because I do plan on taking my tuning to the next level just because I want more control over my setup. But, um, so that would be my choice from an 
uneducated, just looking at it and seeing it used for a lot of years and actually using one at my shop here. It's just, it's awesome. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Those are like, I have two of those now cause we have two stations set up now hmm. at the shop. But yeah, I love those. Those are my favorite. There's a lot of different types. So you can get some fairly cheap ones. Some of them screw into where your stabilizer would go. Mm -hmm. So you're going to screw a piece into that and then you're going to mount that into another sort of coupling type thing on the device. Um, some of them clamp down on the, on the limbs. Um, some of them will clamp down on your uh, grip. So there's a lot of different bow vices out there. You know, uh, the Versa cradles aren't cheap by any means. They're a couple hundred bucks. Oh, and really? then, yeah. And then if you want the uh, wide limb adapters, which is what you need to work on any of the Matthews bows anymore, or the Hoyts really, you might be able to get away with the small one with the Hoyts, but really the Matthews bows. Probably a PSE too with the wedge lock system. Those, those limbs yeah. are pretty, pretty fat now. With well, and Bowtex. Same thing. Mm. So that's like another 85 bucks to get the wide limit. <laughs> so you're looking at a few hundred bucks there for the OMP one. It is one of the, it, it, it's relatively expensive. Like right? what would you know? be a uh, better budget um, choice for a guy, say a hundred to $200. Uh, you know, I'm not sure really what's in that range. I know, uh, uh, Butch Baker, um, you know, he's who makes a lot of Austin string jigs and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I think it's BAP or BPA um, is, is his company. And he's got one that's coming out um, that goes uh, right on the edge of, of, a, of the press, I believe. Um, and his are pretty nice. Austin has one of his, I believe, is what Austin runs right now. Mm. Uh, but those are going to be a couple hundred bucks too. You're... To get a really good bow vice, you're going to be a couple hundred bucks into it. That makes sense. It just seems like the the jump from doing minor versus major bow work is an expensive jump. I'm trying to remember the one I had. The one I had before. So the type that screw into your stabilizer hole, basically, mm -hmm. bow. Um, I want to say you can find those for like 40 or 50 bucks. I just can't remember the name brand. That's what I started with. So okay. I was doing my own home stuff. And it was a giant pain in the butt because, you know, you screw it into that, in that stabilizer spot and then you put it into the coupler that's on the bow vice itself. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just have a linear motion that you can move your bow. And so you can't really tilt your bow in a lot of different directions yeah. to make it easier to work on. And then what would happen is sometimes if you did have it tilted, it would want to unscrew. <laughs> So the boats are falling. You're, you're getting what you pay for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you really are. The, the Versa Cradle one, I love that one because literally you can move the bow in any direction yeah. you want. You can lay it completely out, um, which is kind of how I have mine set up. So when I'm tying in my D loops, when I'm tying in serving a lot of times, I, uh, I won't necessarily do that on the press. I do it in the bow vise and I just lay the bow out. Mm -hmm. So that it's laying out in front of me like it would be on the, uh, on the press, but it's in the bow vice instead. So. I, yeah. Cause my shop has that one. I've used it a lot of times and I've just fell in love with it. It's just nice. It is. And it's like you said, once you, even when you lay it over and there's all that weight, it still stays. I mean, it, it's a solid, really good. I don't know. I, I agree with you. I mean, you, you would know better than I would, but to full heartedly, that would be the one that I would choose on the market and I'll try and find a link for it or something, put it in the uh, show notes or something, yeah, but. It's October Mountain Products, OMP. OMP. Okay. So, so yeah, October Mountain Products. If guys want to go look it up, um, they make some really good stuff. Uh, you know, I like their stuff. So, if we're talking about brands, that's what I use for a bow vice. Uh, when we were talking about uh, the string levels and stuff, I use the K Tech. Um, okay. It's blue, and you can get those off of Lancaster. They're like fifty-five bucks, I think, hmm. for the one that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Austin has a different one that was really nice too. So there's several of those, but anyway, yeah. So a, a bow vice would be really, really, really helpful. Um, and again, guys are just going to have to look around and, and look when, when you look, if you are going to get one um, and you're unsure what you want, you know, look at what it'll do. How will it spin the bow? What application can you use it with? Um, you know, some of them are pretty cool. There's another one out there. I think it's Ram. Ram makes it, uh, literally there's knobs on the side 
and you can level. So once you get the bow in the bow vise, you can like micro level it. <laughs> That's cool. You know, um, so there's each one kind of has their good points and their bad points. So for getting to the uh, bow press area, um, I see a lot of guys using like X presses and stuff like that. What is your your choice? So I go with the last chance easy press. Okay. So that's a popular one too. Yeah, it's. I like it a lot. Um, I hated when you had to buy the Hoyt limb adapters for the Defiant series, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're still supposed to be using those. Um, although every archery shop I've been into that sells Hoyt, I never <laughs> see any of them use the Ultra Lock uh, limb adapters with the new RX series bows. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the last chance is a, is a good press. Um, there are some knockoffs out there. There's actually a guy in Klamath Falls that's making some that are somewhat similar hmm. and they're cheaper. <laughs> okay. You know, last chance charges you quite a bit for them. Um, We're talking probably seven, 800 bucks, aren't we? Well, no. Okay. So you can get their easy green and it's a crank handle for the guy who is just going to do his bow or his, <laughs> you know, a couple bows that, crank handle is perfectly fine it will press any bow you've got um and you can take a bow completely apart i mean that thing will go out to 40 some odd inches hmm. so you know if you needed to actually strip a bow all the way down you can you can let it all the way out take the limbs off everything else and then put it back together in that press interesting so, what's that run i think the easy greens you can find them on sale sometimes for uh 3.99 or 425 bucks. Okay. You know, um, they do make another one now. I, again, I don't, it's been a while since I've looked at a lot of products, but I saw one the other day that they called, uh, it's like a packable press and literally it had a bag that you could you crank it down and make it ultra small and put it in the bag and take it with you to go. And those were actually cheaper. And mm -hmm. that might be, um, I think those were in the low threes. That might be a great option for somebody that's just going to work on their stuff. You know, I went, I mean, you can get, so you can jump up to their full seven, eight, nine hundred dollar models. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mine has a motorized or a motor on one end and a foot pedal. I can run it in and out so I don't have to hand crank it at all. Right. Uh, I see those a lot. I see the, my local shop has that. Um, and it's nice. It is nice. And it also does a uh, draw pull uh, or a draw board as well. Yeah. So the last chance they make a draw board that goes right into their presses. Um, their draw board's okay. <laughs> I, uh, there's another company out there called Archery Designs, and but it's spelled with a Z. Okay. Um, they make a draw board. And so I have a last chance draw board and I have the Archery Designs draw board. And what I like to use is I'm actually using his, uh, so on the front end, he's got a little, it's where your bow attaches um, basically for the draw board. Mm -hmm. And I use the archery design one rather than the last chance on both of mine. So where does the, um, where does the last chance fall short compared to the other one? Um, I've had to send mine back to get repaired. <laughs> okay. Uh, the clutch on it. So it's, they're both supposed to be a clutch system, meaning you crank it back you stop cranking, it should just sit there. You mm -hmm. start cranking the other way, it should go down. It used to be there was a little button you had to hold and it was a giant pain in the butt. Um, I have had my last chance want to go. Okay. Crank back, crank back, crank back, stop, let go of the handle and it wants to go. It has a clutch in it, so it's not supposed to, like you're not supposed to be able to dry fire the bow. Like You don't have to have a, <laughs> an arrow in it, um, but it still sketches me out when it does it. Yeah. And, uh, and their cord, uh, it literally is just, it's a small like cord that you're, that the whole draw board runs off of, hmm. uh, you know, that you're cranking back with versus the Archer design one. He actually uses a nylon strap that's like half inch wide strapping. Hmm. So it just seems more robust uh, to me, mm -hmm. but uh, the art, the last chance is the one I do use the most. It is on my main press. So I have one main bow press in the shop that we, that we use. 
The other one's kind of more of a backup traveling bow press. Hmm. So, so if, if I had a bow press and I didn't have a um, draw board, it would, to me, that would almost seem like it would be shooting myself in the foot because you can't, I mean, there's a really good way to do timing without a draw, draw board because I don't know of one. Yeah, have your buddy sit there and then you've got <laughs> to have the control mm -hmm. within you know, your muscles and yourself to be able to let, get it to full draw and then let down just enough to see which draw stop comes off. But you've got to be, at, it's so hard to do. Yeah, I've it done is, that. It's a pain in the ass. I mean, it and is. it's not really that precise because no. you're <laughs> in and out, in and out, in and out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, which what I have seen is, you know, timing can change, believe it or not. I watched this not to bash Hoyt. Hoyt, don't kill me for this. Um, <laughs> but I have watched in my draw board. I get it to full draw, check timing. I let down three or four inches and mm -hmm. I go back and my timing's changed. Really? Until I let all the way down. Once I let all the way down, draw it back, I'm back to what the original timing was. So mm -hmm. I haven't played with it with other manufacturers to see if theirs do it as well. But I can tell you that the RX series does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not to get on the Hoyt, Hoyt soapbox here, but um, have you, yeah, now they're coming out with the, uh, the fix for the siding bracket plate thing. Have yeah, you seen I, I'm actually waiting for my phone to vibrate telling me that UPS showed up with my RX3. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> your, your listeners are going to bash me to death after talking about, I'm not getting a new bow this year. I know. <laughs> I just said I have a Helix. Right. And my RX3 is supposed to get delivered today. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you defend that one. <laughs> uh, well, so here, here's what I'll say about that, not to get too far down a different rabbit hole, but you know, being that we, that we're more of a tuning business than anything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I kind of feel like I need to be shooting kind of the latest, greatest. I need to play with it. I need to mess with it. I need to screw around with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so the reason I have two, just we'll get that out there, is I convinced myself to buy the carbon bow. <laughs> <laughs> that was my wife that just walked by. Perfect. <laughs> uh, I waved at her. <laughs> <laughs> uh so I decided I needed to have, I wanted the carbon bow. I was going to buy, so mm -hmm. I ordered it. Um, I don't get them from Hoyt, so I didn't, it's not coming directly from Hoyt, but I ordered it and it, I was told six to eight weeks. In the meantime, I was up playing around at another archery shop that is a Hoyt dealer and they had a Helix in and the a Helix Ultra and the Arc3 Ultra. Mm. And I spent about two hours going back and forth between the two bows. And when I was done, I was like, well, that sucks. I should have ordered the Helix. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it more than the really? car. I really did. It just, after spending a couple hours, and that's the hard part when you go shoot bows. You shoot 10, 15 arrows, maybe 20, you know, and you kind of sort of get a feel for them. Mm -hmm. But when you spend a couple hours, and it was, I was really, you know, thankful the shop let me, and I was just swapping back and forth forth and back and forth and back and forth. I had both bows laying there and I'd shoot one and shoot the other, shoot one and shoot the other mm -hmm. uh, that I needed the Helix Ultra. <laughs> so luckily for me, um, and I'm not going to get into the whole story, but I was able to essentially win one at a banquet Oh, and was told I could pick whatever bow I wanted. And so I picked the Helix Ultra. That was two weeks from the day that the shop ordered it. Mm-hmm. So I had it in my hands and <laughs> really? it's, an 80, it's an 80 pound helix ultra. Hmm. So, and I love that bow so far. Uh, I did have, it, it's been interesting again, not to get too far into a tangent on this other stuff and waste too much time, but yeah, no worries. Uh, my, uh, my arrows from last year. So I, last year shooting the RX one ultra at 80 pounds and I was able to use an Easton axis 260. My helix is slower and it won't spine with the 260. Hmm. I get a good tear, bad tear, good tear, bad tear. I had to go to a 200 spine arrow, and I'm getting absolutely beautiful arrow flight. I posted a picture the other day. Uh, I shot uh, a broadhead at 40 yards mm -hmm. and a bear shaft 
F40. I saw yards. that. I saw that picture. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, at 40 yards, they were like an inch and a half apart. That's good enough for me. Uh, you know, obviously, I'd love to shoot better. But when I can shoot a bare shafted arrow at 40 yards. That's and impressive. Have it with a broadhead mm -hmm. and that close on a brand new bow, you know, I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about this. So, you know, that's actually the Valkyrie system that I was shooting uh, that night. You know, because uh, that was the easiest way for me to get 200 grain air or 200 spine arrows. Mm -hmm. And I actually like how that's coming out. And I may very well shoot that this year. I still love my iron wheels, but finding a 200 spine arrow, um, you know, is is not the easiest thing to do. I know Element makes one, um, and so I'm looking at those because obviously I'd love to run my footers and <laughs> right, you know, and the hit insert system and and the iron wheels or potentially the Valkyries. I, I really gotten interested in the shorty Valkyries. Hmm. So I know I'm getting way down a rabbit hole here, but no. And that, that brings up another thing, your footers. I'm still getting tons of questions on, on where to get these things. Can you remind people of where to get your footers? So I'm still trying to get a website built. I just got quoted, <laughs> I literally just got quoted $4,000. Holy crap. On my website. Um, and all the websites going to be is here. You can order footers. You can order, a t-shirt, a hat, decal. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to have, so I'm kind of throwing this out there now. This would be the, an exclusive. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so the Elk River delivery system um, is, uh, is what we're calling, because I, I just love that delivery system term. So mm -hmm. obviously, because we're building this, okay. Um, but I want to sell Eastern Access Arrows on the website and have people go in and pick out, okay, you know, this is the length I want to cut and this is the knock I want in it. This is brass or aluminum. Mm -hmm. I want a footer. I want it to be this long. I want this color blazer veins. I want them right helical. I want them left helical. I want three fetch fletch. I want four fletch, you know, and have people be able to build their Eastern axis arrows um, and order them straight through the website or just order the footers. But in the meantime, it's still Instagram or Facebook um, or message me. Um, you know, people are emailing me. Um, we, again, cause I'm kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> I finally have, uh, an Elk River Archery Gmail account. And there Gmail you go. <laughs> I was using my old, so I've been using my old personal email address. Um, but it is Elk River Arch at gmail.com because I couldn't get archery. Somebody else has Elk River Archery. Really? For Gmail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but the website, we, we do own the, the domain name or whatever yeah. you call it for elk, elk river archery .com, which is what it will be mm -hmm. when we get the website built. And I may just try it myself, you know, um, I know it won't look nearly as good, uh, you know, as the quote I got. And that was on the high end. It was like, it could be up to $4,000 depending on all the coding. Yeah. yeah. See, I did a Shopify one and it cost me like 30 bucks a month and it, it looks like a, you know, it looks like a Shopify or a my square, whatever pre-made kind of thing, but you get to, you enter your own photos and you can customize it more than a Facebook, but it, you yeah. know, no one goes to my website hardly. So <laughs> I don't have to <laughs> worry about it. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to kind of get that out there cause I'm still getting tons of questions cause the, the videos are still getting views on YouTube and stuff and, and, um, guys are still watching the born and raised, um, video collaboration I did with them and stuff. And so it's just nice to try and get out in front of those questions. So I get less and I don't mind messages guys, but you can get the photos from Chris at Elk river. That's where I get mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, well, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate that, you know? Um, but yeah, guys can just message me. We get a lot of messages and the footers, uh, you know, I've been a pretty big, pretty big hit with people and you know, yeah. it's, it's fun to see, you know, cause again, this all was, trying to make myself and make anybody else that wants to, you know, have a better system, you know, with just less likelihood for problems. So, yeah. And, and it's amazing. What is amazing uh, are the stories I'm getting from people about how well they worked. I had a guy the other day message me and he's like, Hey, look, I hit the rebar in this, uh, <laughs> in this 3d target and my arrows ruined, but you know, I can't believe how well it held up. And I text him back and I said, uh, I don't think your arrow's ruined, man. You know, 
Huh. I can see where there's a, a bulge in it, but you know, and your field tips bent, kind of like the video I posted that had the same mm -hmm. thing happen to me. I said, when you get home, put some channel locks on it, get that off. And he messaged me and he goes, I can't believe it. The arrow's still good. Hmm. And he put a field tip in it, spun perfect. There's oh, a yeah. little bulge in the end, you know, but it'd be a great grouse arrow or, you know, hey, that's a 99 yard shot through some trees and a rock at a 3D course, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah, send this arrow down there. <laughs> I, I've, I've shot them into steel targets um, versus non footered arrows, and it's just it's shocking the difference that you get out of them. So it's a good product, man. I think the best products out there are the ones that people are trying to solve a, a problem that they run into, and yeah. uh, that's you know that's what yours did. It's solving an issue, uh, a weak kind of a weak point, you know, and and the hidden insert technology there and. I think it does a great job. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't see me ever going back to not using them if I keep using Axis. They're, they're going to be a permanent part of my setup just as having to have a knock is on there. You know, it's just part of my arrow setup now. But, um, but yeah, so back into the, in, into the actual <laughs> topic. Um, so you're, you're suggesting the last chance? That's the press I really like. It, it seems to be the most versatile. Um, some of the other ones, X presses and stuff, they can be a little bit of a pain to set mm -hmm. up and change between bow to bow. Uh, you know, the last chance it's literally just slide the fingers, you know, out or in as you need and then press the bow. Um, it just works really well, but you do have to be careful. Like if you have the Hoyt Defiant or whatever, then you've got to buy the extra $180 Hoyt ultra lock adapters. Right. Um, so for like, uh, for some, some other things that probably aren't as important, I would suggest for me, cause I want to know if my bow's making IBO, you know, not, not, I don't care about shooting IBO. I just want to make sure I'm getting the speeds I should be getting, making sure everything's right. I, I like having a chronograph. Uh, I use the shit out of my chronograph. I use it all the time. I even use it for paper tuning. I'll actually just tape a piece of like printer paper up there on the uh, bars that come down that go over to the little dome things. Yeah. Yeah, the light kit that's on there. Yeah, and I I shoot through paper on that thing. It's also my paper tuning, you know. I'd never hit my chronograph or anything. It's not a problem. But uh chronographs for me, it's it's it, it I don't know, it's just really it's really nice to have one and you can see what kind of, you know, does doing this different to your string or doing this different to your arrow gaining you. It's just it's just nice to see um what, what your bow's putting those arrows out and for consist consistency and everything. Is there any, anything outside of a bow press and a draw board that you suggest using? Um, I, well, some sort of paper tuning rig. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you just you brought that up. Um, you know, some way to, to, to shoot your bow through paper. I built my first one out of PVC. I just went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of PVC and a bunch mm -hmm. of nineties and glued a thing together and, basically took a T and, uh, cut, cut like the T portion in half. So I could just shove the pipe down in when I wanted to and just laid the, laid the paper in there, you know, and mm -hmm. a roll of paper. Um, now my paper tinning rig is even simpler than that. Uh, cause it's hung from the ceiling, but I literally just bought some long eye bolts and some half inch EMT and contractor paper from Lowe's hmm. and, doesn't have to be anything special. Just has to, you know, allow your arrow to shoot through it without getting um, angles in the paper or anything. Really, it just needs to be a flat piece of paper that you can shoot through. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I mean, I'm taping up with with packaging tape and a print piece of printer paper. You know, one of those little eight by eleven, whatever they are, and it works just fine. I can see exactly what what's going on. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to think of anything else that a guy would need. Um, you know, you could run with a long level. Some people like when they put their bow in a bow vise, they'll run a like a four foot level or mm -hmm. three foot level on the side of the limbs, um, just to make sure it's level that way. You know, uh, there's lots of ways to go, but no, your basic tools. You know, I think we've covered we've covered most of the basic tools. Draw boards, by the way, guys, you can build the draw board out of um, you know wood. I've seen guys do it before. There's a lot. You get on archery talk or you you search YouTube. You can find ways to make stuff. A boat winch. Right. That's what also was coming to my mind is like, man, you could just. Yeah. A boat winch with, with, you know, a, a good, really heavy wood dowel or something. Or if you're can weld, 
you know, it all just, you know, a piece of metal and put some rubber shrink tube over it or something to, you know, so that you don't mess your bow up. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even put, you know, some of the draw boards out there, they'll put a, uh, like a tape down ruler on there so you can measure your draw length hmm. and be pretty specific. I just use ours. I just take a tape measure and when I'm checking draw length and get it to full draw and then just tape it out. But where uh, are you uh, taping from? So I tape from the, uh, uh, from where the arrow knocks basically on the string. So from mm -hmm. the string itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then I measure it to the grip. And then I think it's a 1.75 inch adder is what it's supposed to be um, to actually get your real draw length, what the bow's draw length is. So you do so, that measurement and then you add 1.75 inches? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you Google, if you Google it, there's a way like how, how does, um, you know, IBO measure draw length. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't know that. I always thought it was from the grip to the, string for years yeah until a couple years until a couple years ago when i googled it and i was like oh we're supposed to be adding 1.75 inches like it's like 1.75 or 1.25 um you can obviously tell i don't check draw length that much on most bows because <laughs> mm -hmm. i don't remember the calculation um right off the top of my head uh because to be honest every bow manufacturer is a little different and i just kind of quit worrying about it until you know, I just get the bow to fit the customer right? type of thing. Like what fits them well. And, you know, if the bow's 29 and a half or supposed to be 29 and a half and it's 29 and three quarters, but if it's the customer, whatever. You well, know? I mean, would that work for all bows? I mean, because I know the Matthews are run a half inch long. Um, it's to, to me anyways. Well, so there's, there's, uh, there's what's supposed to be, <laughs> right? <laughs> And this is the calculation that's supposed to happen mm -hmm. versus what manufacturers actually put out. And um, there are a few companies that are known to run their draw length long. Mm -hmm. There are a few companies that are known to be pretty, pretty good. You got me curious here. Um, there's, there's one point I want to bring up here and, and it's only because you said IBO in the way that you, you thought it was versus the way that it actually is. Um, Cause when I was, um, some, you know, some of these guys are using IBO and some of them are using, I think, AMA or uh, ATA, I think. Yeah. And there's a difference between, because Hoyt uses ATA uh, for speeds a lot of times um, on their websites. I don't know if you've seen that at all. Um, Hoyt IBO, I'm going to type in Hoyt IBO here, but there's a difference between, um, I want to say it's American. It's ATA. It's ATA. ATA versus IBO. Yeah. And, and then, so ATA is strict. Uh, from my, from what I've gathered is strict what everybody thinks IBO is. It's 30 yeah. inches, 70 pounds. Um, five grains per pound. Five grains per pound. I, IBO yeah. is five grains per pound. It's not necessarily 30 inches IBO is. And that's why I believe some guys are going ATA. And that's why I think that you're getting, and I might be full of crap here, um, but that's why there's a difference between ATA and IBO. They're very similar, except I believe IBO is just saying seven grains or five grains um, per seven pounds. And that's why you have some of these bows that are getting outrageous IBOs. And then when people are testing them, they're not making it. Does that seem fair or accurate to you at all? Um, I've got to double check. So IBO at least from is supposed to be basically 70 pounds, 30 inch draw, 350 grain arrow. Right. That's what it should be. Right. Um, and ATA, I thought was really similar, but now you got me. I kind of want to Google it. Real quick. <laughs> I'm Googling it right now. Um, ATA versus IBO. But back, and, and you know, granted, I'm getting this is off of a website that could be full of shit. You know, they yeah. might not even know what they're talking about. But um, from the websites that I researched, is, you know, it's, it's all of that except uh, IBO doesn't have a draw. It's just, that's the IBO. You can do 31 inches or 32. And then, then ATA is the strict 350, 70 pound five or uh, yeah, 30 inch. Yeah. I think, uh, and then that might, it, that might be, I think, you know, with the IBO speeds, it's one of those things where the manufacturer is supposed to tell you what they tested it at type of thing. Like mm -hmm. our speeds are rated at 31 inches and 75 pounds. Yeah. Versus, you know, the ATA, um, 
which I know Hoyt uses an AT8. It's not really an IBO on their bows. Right. Right. So, um, and I've always wondered why. And then, you know, (laughs) so, um, I might have to do some digging on that and then do, uh, do a correction on myself later. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I just, so I just did a quick Google search on draw length real quick. Uh Um, and it's the draw length is taken by taken the, the, Draw length is calculated by taking the actual draw length and adding one and three quarters inch. Okay, that makes sense. That's exactly what you so said. From from the grip to the string at full draw plus one and three quarters inches. That makes sense. Yeah. So you, you were dead on about that. So, but uh, yeah, it's what's funny. Uh, so my Hoyt Helix mm-hmm. uh, feels shorter than my RX One last year. Really? So I am shooting it at thirty one and a half inches. Now, I shot 31 inch last year on my RX1. You got me suspicious. You're saying that the spine is a little bit stiffer this year to get it to tune, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is the brace height shorter this year? Or no, it's longer. So what's brace going on there? Uh, you know, it's it's just it's not more of a, every bow, every cam, every you know they they like a different thing. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's really hard to say. Um, you know, it is slower. Like I'm shooting a 500 and what am I shooting right now? Now I've got to remember it's 590, 590 green arrow. I think, um, that I tested at 31 and a half inches mm-hmm. and I was getting like 284 at 82 pounds. Last year you were and like 610 year, at 287, right? Uh, yeah, I was six, 609 or something like that. Yeah. At, I know I tested. So last year I tested a 636. <laughs> at a thirty-one at a thirty-one inch draw, mm-hmm. and was two seventy-eight. Hmm. That's so. But shorter brace height, so you know, I, I, I'm not surprising. It's a little bit faster, even though they're rated the same. Yeah. Um, but it's weird that the shorter brace height, kind of like you were mentioning, would need a weaker spine. Yeah. The axis because on my axis I built this year to try and shoot out of helix. Mm-hmm. I didn't put brass in them either. So I had at one point I had 241 grains up front in my eastern axis for last year's bow. Mm-hmm. And this year's I had cut that back to 190 hmm. around there, and it still just wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't spine out. It was just weird. It's just yeah. the axis arrows, no matter what I did, and I wanted to shoot them really bad, mm-hmm. but. They wouldn't they were not working that is really weird that is really weird well every you know it's like you said everybody everybody likes something a little bit different and, and i get guys asking me you know what spine should i shoot i'm like well based off of my experiences you know your shit may can be completely different than mine but you know you're either properly spined or you could go you know an extra 50 grains and still be you know because I've, I've tested to the point on on my bows in the in the past and again it's, it's per setup per bow and everything, you know, how, how much can I add before I start getting that erratic arrow behavior and it won't tune and stuff. It's just kind of cool to see where you're actually under spine, you know, just how far can you push it or I don't know. I, I, I geek out on that stuff there. (laughs) Um, well, I think we covered and probably what I'll do is I'll put a bunch of shit cause I, I'm, I am now a smarter YouTuber. Uh, I, I am a, I am a Amazon affiliate which means I can sell shit on Amazon by people clicking on uh, the links down below. So I'll, I'll have links to a bunch of this stuff down below. And, and, and even though, you know, I do get paid for that, I, I'm a big fan of support, you know, supporting your local bow shop first um, rather than, than, than Amazon. So if you guys can find this stuff on, you know, it's your local pro shop, go do it. But if you can't and you're in a hurry, click on some of the links down below and then you can either click on the link and then search for what you need or click on the item and then, any, any, anything that you do from there and buy actually supports the podcast now. So, um, kind of uh, cool there just to go over a couple more little tools that guys might want to have around a good Sharpie, you know, a set of picks, um, uh, an e-clip tool. So, cause you're taking those for your those, axles. Yep. Yep. Um, it's amazing what a good tool will do versus trying to press it off with something else and have them shoot all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, it depends on how deep a guy wants to get. You can order shim kits. Um, so you have shims around. Um, I'm just trying to think. There was a couple other tools that I had thought of. 
while we were talking here right at the very end that we're like, oh, we didn't really cover that. We didn't really cover that, <laughs> which always happens. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's stuff that we we forgot to mention or even go over here, but um, for for 90% of what, a, over 90%, I, I believe for pretty much 95% of what a guy is going to need to start working on his bow here. And he'll figure out stuff that he wants that maybe you don't care about that yeah. he, maybe he likes, you know, because I know, um, some guys have these little leather wraps around their thumbs and around their fingers for tie in servings and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can cinch them down harder and stuff like that. It, and it doesn't hurt their fingers. Um, they use those down at, uh, our shop down here. I don't know if you have those little finger protectors. Uh, I cut my fingers all the time. Do you? <laughs> I, I, I'm not smart enough to protect them. <laughs> <laughs> so Every once in a while they get bad, I'll tape them up. But uh, I will say on serving guys, you know, you really want to be careful that you don't, pull your serving through too fast uh like when you're back serving mm. um or really drag it across you can the the reason i say it is you can actually burn through or cut through fibers on your string with serving material mm-hmm. if you're not a little bit careful right uh, you're just ripping and tearing through it um you know i saw a guy post the other day uh about he had tied his serving in and then he cut it off i saw and that got some fibers cut and you know, most people are saying, oh, it was a razor that did it. And I'm looking at it going, no, I've seen that several times. And that's somebody that, that pulled their back serving through too fast and didn't see any phrase or anything because it was under the serving. And as soon as they cut the serving off, here's some, you know, fibers that are burned. Because when you pull that serving through really quick, it can heat up and it doesn't take much to burn through some fibers on your string. So just be careful. Uh, dental floss is a great way to practice actually. Mm. And in a pinch out in the field, <laughs> I, actually, I, I used to, now I carry serving, but I used to carry dental floss with me mm-hmm. because if I needed to retie in my peep or quick serve something on my bow, I would just do it with dental floss. Hmm. I never thought about that. Yeah. I carry serving with me. Yeah. I just, I didn't have it. I don't know why it was like, uh, you know, that was back when Cabela's wasn't around and sportsman's wasn't around. And so it was like, Oh, what do I got? That's quick and easy. Hey, some dental floss. <laughs> it works. You know, in a pinch, in a pinch, it'll work. Um, but it's a great way to practice, you know, at home, watch a YouTube video, grab a pencil or something and lay some serving down on a pencil. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I did, a, uh, I did a video on serving uh, a couple of years ago and I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, I need to redo that video because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serving against the, the, the string. Yeah. And some guys are like just hammering me on there. I'm like, okay, I didn't think about that shit when I made the video. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should redo the video, but it's, it's got like, I don't know how many 30,000 views probably. So hopefully people yeah. know, um, you know, and that's just stuff that you learn through working on your stuff. I mean, trial and error. I mean, you can't expect to learn literally everything, you know, and never make a mistake. You're still going to make a mistake. I mean, I, I make them all the time. I learn stuff all the day or all the time out the other day at Austin's house. Mm-hmm. Um, I was watching him set a bow up and he ties in, in his knock sets different than I do. And it's like, Hey, I like how that goes. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of modified it a little bit, but, um, another tool, uh, would just be like a, a, a bow square or an arrow square, mm-hmm. right. That you stick on your string and kind of get your knock height where it should be based off of your, you know, everything being level and your rest height to run it through the burger hole. So that might be another, you know, quick tool. You don't need to use one of those. I don't use one, but they're kind of nice to have. I mean, I have one in the shop. I don't use it very often because everything is just, you know, we start out square and level right. um, and through the burger hole, but uh, it's, you know, it's not a bad tool to have. I, I know that seems to be like, um, I'm not gonna say it's an older kind of going by the wayside tool, but when I learned how to do archery years ago, that was like, you absolutely need this. And then now it's like, I yeah, don't need that. <laughs> like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure my new bow just showed up. I got to text Cody real quick and say, Hey, bring it in here. If it's- oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So <laughs> was there any, is there anything else that you can think of that a guy would need? Um, or any, any last, last minute tips while I wrap this thing up here? Cause we're, we've already been going for over an hour. I really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hour and six minutes, probably about an hour with all the bullshitting we did in the beginning. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been a really, for me, it's been an informative pod, podcast and stuff. And um, though, you know, I wish I could get the jig and I almost bought it. Um, I shouldn't say jig bow press. There it is. Hey, the bow. 
<laughs> for everybody that thinks that Chris hates Hoyt, there's there's your proof. He does not hate Hoyt. I do not hate Hoyt. Uh, yeah. you know, as far as other things that we uh, that we would need to talk about, I uh, can't really think of any other tools off the top of my head. Um, sorry, I'm opening my new bow because I'm excited. <laughs> Christmas in April. My new quiver. Oh, you got the quiver with it too, huh? Yeah, I went ahead and got the carbon solo quiver. I decided to try it. It's two piece. Was it like two million dollars for that? <laughs> yeah, there's a half for you, son. Something like that. <laughs> this, is, this is this is like this should get more views. This is the yeah, live it's a, unboxing. It's an unboxing now. It's an unboxing Hoyt video. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else in the bottom there. Um, we can see the fix that. Uh, that they did to see if they put it on the brand new bows. Oh, the plate. Yeah. You know, I'll go over that real quick. Cause I got some, some opinions that'll probably piss people off, but what's an opinion if you can't use it. Right. So with the plate no. and, and, and the, uh, no plate. Yeah. So with that plate, well, the, the updated thing there, um, when they sent out the, cause I saw guys posting pictures of the mailer and the flyer that they were sending out with them. They were blaming the sites. Like they did, some sites don't have enough I dialage. I, my, my, I own it quite that way, but I, I did see that, that there was problems with the way I read it and I was reading it really quick was more uh, of, of like, Hey, there's been issues with some sites being put on the bows yeah. and people running out of left adjustment, but not, Hey, your site has an issue. Can't, yeah. I didn't quite read it that way. I did well. I should, yeah. I should reframe. I read it the way you did it. I'm like, guys, I feel like you're putting it on the site. You're kind of being, you're not owning it completely. Is kind of the way that I felt about it. It's like, oh, since some sites don't have enough adjustment, we're gonna make this. You know, <laughs> I was like, okay, guys. Yeah. All right, but you All know, right. They're, they're taking care of people. They're doing, they're doing the right thing, and and um, you know, that's why people buy Hoyts because they got great customer service. So. Yeah, they, they could have handled this one a little better. I am a little shocked that that's not on there, though, that the fix, yeah. because I was told all new bows were coming with that. Um, but we'll have to see. Hopefully, I have zero issue, um, you know, with it. But And you yeah. said you haven't seen any come through your shop that needed that, right? Correct. Holy smokes. Um, I don't know if you heard that guy going. Yeah. 55 and a 20, I guarantee you. Yeah, but, I like um, I like it though. It actually came with blue strings, even though it's sad I'm gonna have to take them off and throw Austin's on right away. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, all right, man. Well, yeah. Go ahead, get that thing set up, and uh, we're gonna have to get get back on the show and go over like a pack dump episode or or stuff that you bring on on your backpacking hunting trips or whatever. And geek and, out on some gear. We can talk about my inflatable lanterns, dude. I almost beat you to the punch on that one because, um, I was actually going to record a, uh, YouTube video about, um, shit that I have that you don't know about <laughs> kind of thing. Like things that you should have in your pack that you don't even know about kind of thing. Oh. The, uh, inflatable, uh, lighting pillow is one of them. That's probably my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a then, lantern that doubles as a pillow. Exactly. The thing is a flotation sweet. device. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're hunting over at the coast and it starts pouring on you. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's a couple other, there's the uh, game changer elk call I was going to do. Yep. And then, uh, we have those in the shop now too. So we're, yeah. Game changer, yeah, we're a game changer dealer. Cool. So bendable products. Now we've got their stuff in. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to have Freddie on the podcast here soon. Um, to talk about his, his, uh, game changer call and yeah. I can see him expanding in other areas too, but yeah. So it's, there, there's some cool gear out there, man. And, and uh, I think you showed me, wasn't there another thing that you showed me too that I hadn't seen before? It was not the, it was the lighting pillow thingy. And then there was, I thought there was one other thing that you showed me. I was like, where in the hell? What was that? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. I know the lighting pillow came from you. <laughs> yeah. It's yep, the, the lantern. And, and it was something funny thing is it had been in my pack for over a year. Oh, really? and, it wasn't until, and I never even thought about using it until <laughs> we were working on my bowl. And I think our headlamps were kind of going dead and we just needed it. And I'm like, hey, I got this thing. Let's try it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. Where did you get it? Uh, I actually, so that one came from uh, when I bought some of the Grizzly Stick Arrows. Uh -huh. like I bought it from, 
just threw it in. He's like, hey, here's a free <laughs> gift for you. Really? I, I'm like, I got it. I'm like, what the hell is this thing? You know, and it's right. Anyhow. So, yeah. So then after I discovered how much I liked them, it was like, oh, I got to go Google search them and find them and find a bunch of them. And then when you came down, I threw one your way. And what are they called? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find them. Uh, you're going to have to look at, I'll have to text it to you. Okay. Um, yeah. Because I don't remember the brand name, um, but they make several of them now. They have some bigger ones that are actually USB chargeable versus straight forward. <laughs> really? Um, That's yeah. Cool. And they're, those ones are square and they're a little heavier. The one that I gave you, that packable one, mm-hmm. it's just straight solar, you know, so charge it up, should stay charged up. And mm. Well, I don't, I don't know if you can see outside here, Chris, uh, how bright it is. Uh, the bears are calling my name. All right. And so I, I need to get going here, brother. Go, but go kill a bear. Oh, there, oh. there's the pill. <laughs> we'll, we'll do, I'll do a video here soon. Luminate. There you go, right there. I'm going to put a link to that. I'm going to make money on that on Amazon. So I'm going to post that and then just tell people to go buy it on Amazon or something. But there you go. All right, brother. Well, uh, really appreciate you coming back on the show. Cody, you're awesome. Good to see you, brother. <laughs> see ya. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Garrett. See you, Chris. Bye. We'll talk to you later. Bye.